All right, welcome back to another edition of May Day Mondays. Uh, I really appreciate everybody coming. Um, I want to get started before we dig into this month's subject with, uh, again, a review of the firefighters that we have lost since the last time we got together. Um, there were two helicopter pilots were killed that were uh, with their aircraft crash while they were fighting the Moose Fire in Idaho. A uh, firefighter cadet in Alabama died uh, after suffering a medical emergency after training. A young volunteer firefighter in Wisconsin suffered an apparent brain aneurysm after fighting a fire earlier in the evening. An Oregon wildland firefighter was struck by a falling tree while fighting the big swamp fire. A uh, fire truck crash took the life of a longtime member of the Memphis Fire Department. A volunteer captain in New York died from an apparent heart attack. Another wildland firefighter was killed by a falling tree while fighting the Rum Creek Fire, also in Oregon. And then uh, so far, in, in, uh, up to, to bring us up to speed, up to date in, in, in Iowa, a volunteer captain suffered an apparent heart attack. So if, when you have some time, please take some, some time and remember these fire service members and also pray for their families and their friends in this difficult time. Uh, last month, I wanna share my screen. Last month, you all will remember that we uh, looked at a fire from Dallas, Texas. Oh, I just did that. A fire from Dallas, Texas um, that killed Lieutenant Todd Crodel. Um, again, he was heading up to do vertical ventilation on a, a fire in an apartment building. Um, and unbeknownst to them, it was a weakened, the, the roof had already been weakened by a previous fire. Um, Todd fell through and um, was unable to recover from the injuries he suffered in that fire. Um, some things, again, uh, what we want to emphasize from that is um, if, if you are a department that, that does do vertical ventilation, and I hope that everybody has that as an option, but you need to have some good SOPs, you need to have good tools, you need to have good training, and that's going to help tip the scales in your favor to make it a successful event. So, you know, take some time out. Remember, Lieutenant Crodel, there's a great organization down there that's helping to raise money for different different charities and stuff in the Dallas area in his honor. So please, uh, if you haven't had a chance, go back, look at that podcast. There was some longtime uh, Dallas, Texas firefighters who were with us on that. And also get out and practice your vertical ventilation uh, operations so you're ready for the the next fire. This month, this month, we're going to change things up a little bit. Um, if you've been with me and, and following this, you know, for the last seven plus years, we've been um, honoring, remembering line of duty death, firefighters who have died in the line of duty. Um, this month, it's a little different. Uh, we have a, a close call. These members um, use their training, use their equipment, use their uh, mindset. Um, and uh, not only did they survive a tough situation, but they were able to rescue a civilian from this fire. So we're going to emphasize this month on escape, escape techniques. Uh, we have, we have uh, in the past talked about uh, window hangs, uh, ladder slides, things like that. We really haven't talked too much about the rope, the rope um, technique, rope, rope operations with this. So if you have a personal escape system, this is time to kind of review those operations and to talk about personal escape systems uh, brought in a couple of experts <laughs> it's hard to say that when i look at these guys but um but they are uh, friends and uh, fellow fire service uh, professionals don Calarusa and uh kelly Byrne. don will you do me a favor and just introduce yourself to the the viewers well thank you tony uh I'm Don Calarusso. I've been in the fire service for 35 years, and I've been engaged with uh, firefighter escape systems since 2006. And uh, through through my company, All Hands Fire, we have uh, trained and equipped countless firefighters in uh, in our region here, as far out as probably Kansas. And uh, Don's a longtime volunteer. What is you don't call that the Jersey Shore, right? You call that like uh, North Jersey or something? 
we're, we're just in Jersey. <laughs> just in we're Jersey. on the Jersey Shore, but uh, there's no affiliation to the horrible TV show. No, no, no. It's great, great area. I've been up there a couple of times and visited with him and uh, did some training. And uh, it's a really, really neat area. Um, and I can't wait to get back. Um, what's the name of the ice cream places you go to? <laughs> Days Ice Cream. Yeah, yeah. That's a shout a lot out. Of mileage, uh, that little comment, but thanks. <laughs> shout out. To, <laughs> also, also with me, uh, with us is uh, Kelly Byrne. Kelly, can you do the same? Introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. My name's Kelly Byrne. I'm a fireman in Washington, D.C. Been there since 2000. Uh, I was at, I am at the same company you were at. Uh, rescue squad two i've been there since uh 2003 and about the past five years as the driver uh started off as a volunteer in uh, montgomery county maryland uh worked for a little bit in baltimore county maryland uh did a little stint in the 82nd airborne um got interested in firefighter escape stuff probably around yeah, i don't know maybe about 2003 was when i was first introduced to it got more heavily involved in like 2006 and 7 i really did a deep dive into it and then uh, just did a ton of research on it, you know, as much as I could at the time, um, put together a presentation I've delivered at the International Technical Rescue Symposium. Uh, I'm a rope geek and that's a rope geek conference. Uh, so the escape stuff uh, spins my gears, like the mashup rope geek stuff and firefighting stuff is, uh, I guess it really does it for me. So um, yeah, so I, I, I do all that. I have my own training company, also work for CMC Rescue as an instructor. And uh, yeah, ha happy to talk about this stuff with you. Thanks for having me. So um, one of the tough parts about this, right, is that this is all really theoretical. Um, I say that because uh, neither one of us, none of us, have performed an emergency a rope escape out of fire, right? Right. So um, this is, I guess, the tough part here then is becomes like a, um, we don't, what if, would you want to talk to someone who says, man, I've bailed out of 15 fires. <laughs> I have used my escape system 15 times. No, and uh, it, it's a legitimate question, right? But it's, you know, I, it's still, I think, worthy of having and wearing and talking about like. I've never been in a head on crash, but I still wear my seatbelt. Like it, it's a, it's a cheap insurance policy. Um, and I think one of the other benefits of this kit of, of all of these kits is if you, if it's just one person out one window, one time, I think, you know, that's a pretty limited view of what you can do with these kits. If you think of it as, you know, a RIT team on your hip, like that is pretty awesome. And to, to kind of bring that around to the, to you, Tony, uh, you know, you, you fell down an elevator shaft at 2300 Good Hope, messed yourself up pretty good. Uh, the guys had to go out to the fire truck, get rope, lower down to you, all that stuff. You know, that incident amongst many others was pretty influential in like trying to find a technique to quickly lower another firefighter or, you know, raise an injured firefighter up out of a, you know, an elevator shaft in your case. So I, you know, I, I think it, there, there's more benefit than just, you know, one window out one person one time. So I, I think there's more to the discussion than, than just that, but you're right. No, nobody wants to hear from a guy who's, you know, bailed out from food on the stove or a light ballast or something. Well, and, and, and I guess I should have started it out by saying, can we not call it a bailout? Right. Because, because again, that, that sounds so like, uh, like you had a choice, right? Like, like I'm going to bail out of this. So, I mean, and, and I, I get it. It's easy. It flows off the tongue, but, but how about a escape, firefighter escape, or I guess, I mean, Kelly, you've, uh, you've actually kind of, you know, thought about it, right. The, the, the firefighter writ pocket or something. I mean, yeah, you know, there is more that you can do to it. And I, I just hate that, you know, we're going to go do bailouts. I don't want to bail out. Sure. Well, our personal escape system really fits it pretty well. because it's, it's, it's in every sense of the word that's what it is yeah yeah right i mean isn't that kind of um bailing out right i, I think that uh it says that uh i think that we have an option and, and ultimately um we're, we're this and we've we've even heard and i know you we've talked about it before about guys who forgot they had the system right and they've had to they use a ladder to escape or they found some other way to get out 
without thinking that, without remembering that, that this thing is on their hip. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely negative connotations. I mean, uh, at a place you once worked, they called them quitter pants for a while. Like that was a, like, it was, it was a big deal. Like you, it, there was a, you know, again, n- numerous, uh, lively discussions about, about having these. And I, I don't think there should be, again, I, I view it like wearing a seatbelt. Like I, nobody argues with me about that. Like I just do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, again, right. Let's go back to that, that place where, where, um, we, we got, uh, we've had a lot of, a lot of, a lot of time in, um, you know, we had again quitter pants, or we had people who says we're going to have more people, you know, going bailing out to go to to rehab. Like, no, we're not. You know, I mean, again, again there was that that fear that this was going to offer guys the option to, to get to to be cowardice, right? To sure. to allow them to get out of some uh, uh, spot that may not have been tough. It, yeah, I mean, I I, I you well. Know. I don't think people who are like that are actually going to jump out of windows, you know, unnecessarily either. So I think it's good, but I, I situation would be very controlled for uh, certain people like that to do that. To- totally. Yeah. I'm, I'm no, I, I think the, the negative connotation is, is, uh, going away. Um, I mean, it's just become a more popular piece of equipment and there's, you know, there's no reason not to have it. It's, it's probably like the switch from, you know, leather lungs to SCBA. Like at some point, it's just the accepted norm for you know personal protective gear. Like, yeah, of course I'm going to wear well, the this. History like, of the fire service, and even in our careers, we've seen this from from pull up pull up boots to, to bunker pants, and you know the uh, even since since this style of escape system has come out, how how much it's evolved and how much we've seen buy in from uh, you know departments where initially. You know, it's like, oh, we don't need that. If you're doing the right thing, you won't, you know, you won't get in that position, which is, you know, it's just you know, saying those things is just, you know, it's, it doesn't really do anyone, yeah, anyone that's what, justice. But that's why they I, call I remember hearing a story when, when ballot systems first came out and just there was a city department and, and uh, a guy needed to do a bailout and uh, he executed it, but then he hung in the windowsill just in fear of, you know, I don't, is this thing going to hold me? Is the windowsill garbage? You know, so like, you know, when this first came out and hearing that story, which is a true story, um, you know, and we've seen, we've seen this thing really kind of evolve over these 12 years, you know, or yeah, I, 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 I guess I, uh, we think about it and I, um, as I d- dug into more risk management principles and stuff, right. If you think about like, like the, the car, right. The automobile, the automobile is designed to, to crash, right? So they outfit it with all these things that you hope you never never use. You know, now they want to put in a um, a backseat sensor. So if you leave your kid in the in the back seat in the in the the kid's seat, right? Um, they want to put a sensor or something. But so I get it, right? These things happen, and that's well, I why always I, like I always like the analogy of the bulletproof vest, you know. Uh-oh. The do, do police officers go on the street expecting to get shot? You know, I mean, they wear it, you know, for the same reason that we would wear in this game system. Yeah, you yeah, know, I definitely, uh, I definitely got ahead of ourselves there. But, 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 um, thank you guys for coming on, and I wanted to provide some, some, uh, some subject matter, not just me talking about these things, but I want to real quick go to um, talk about why we're here and what, what, what happened this month in, in. Um, Again, every month, Mayday Mondays likes to to highlight something that happened in that month. So in September of 2017, um, these guys in Clackamas, Oregon, uh, Heavy Rescue 305, used their escape system to uh, not only to to get out of a tough situation for them, um, fire cut off their, their escape route where they came in, but they also used it to rescue um, a civilian. So to talk about that, let's kind of relate on this stuff. I like to like to 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 drill down into where these incidents come from. This came to us from Clackamas, Oregon. Um, this is up a suburb of Portland. A little bit about Clackamas County, Oregon, is in 2020 it had a population of some 421,000 people. There's 1,800 square miles. The town was founded in 1843. Uh, name for the Clackamas people of the Chinookan Indians. Um, have you guys, you guys have been, I'm sure you've probably been up in that area, right? Yeah. Pacific Northwest. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, yeah. again, beautiful um, stuff. 
Okay. So that's what we're talking about. Some a pretty cool area there. Um, Mount Hood. It's at the uh, is in the county. Um, just some some crazy places um, to go to. Again, if you're not from there, if you're from the Mid Atlantic, it's a whole different world. But Clackamas Fire District is part of that within the within the county. Um, there's different fire districts. So Clackamas Fire District Number One is uh, the biggest. It protects nearly 323 square miles of that 1800 with 235,000 residents. There are 21 stations. Uh, I was talking to the guys there, just again, aside, uh, um, the guys involved in this thing had kind of kind of gotten weary of talking about it. So um, giving them a break and uh, got my other two experts here to talk about it. But the Clackamas Fire District is 21 stations. All this, none of the stations are double houses. They're all a single house. Maybe um, a chief in there with the uh, the engine engine crew or a ladder truck crew. Uh, they have 280 career career members and 80 volunteers um, over those 21 stations. Uh, that's how they're spread out. You can see up up in the up in the, the top left is uh, closer to Portland. Um, they're still a ways away from the city proper, but it is um, a suburb of Portland. They, they do have tenders, so they have some rural water supply areas. They have, um, you know, more urban, kind of near where uh, this, this fire was. Rescue, heavy rescue 305 is from Station 5, which is up here in this area. Um, again, a lot of resources. They got a, a pretty well-staffed department. Uh, these guys look pretty tough. If you see these guys with the saws, um, again, they do a lot of wildland stuff. Let me show you what they're facing right now. This this is from, if I can find it. This they uh, again talk about wild wildland fires. They have, um, they have. Oh, I'm sorry, let me find this. This is a video. Can you guys see the video? Yep. This is a video of a fire. Um, it's it's a ways away from that area, but the mosquito fire. Uh, they're living with this smoke all oh. over. You nah, not that video. Oh. I got. I see your firefighter bailout get uh, oh, no, YouTube. No worries. I'll get that mess. I get that messed up too. So. Um, anyway, so these guys are uh, Clackamas. Clackamas guys. Um, let's go back to this one. How about that? We're back into the PowerPoint. There you go. So the the uh, the fire itself. Was uh, came in at zero three forty nine hours September sixth, twenty seventeen. Um, if you if you um, if you want to know more about this fire, a little bit dig, a deeper dive into it, there's a great video on YouTube, which uh, we can touch on. Um, we can touch on that video. Let me see if I can get it right now. You see that video? No, sir. while you're looking for it it's it's an excellent video i mean it's 26 minutes long but it gives a great step by step of exactly what those guys uh encountered you know on the uh when they arrived on scene and you know the i've never talked to them about it but their their descriptions and you know it was it was well done oh yeah there's the video uh very well done video and uh you know gives it a, a pretty detailed talk about what they did yeah, so um, dig into that if you're interested. Again, it's on YouTube. It's shared in the May Day Monday uh, post that was provided through Fire Engineering. So please uh, check that out. And um, let me go back to let me go back to uh, my PowerPoint presentation here. You see the PowerPoint again? 
Yeah, we're good. All right, so we got this fire again, typical house fire, right? Not not a not a crazy uh, kind of a building that we would go to, probably in everybody's area out there. They were dispatched as the heavy rescue unit in the. Uh, they were going to be first arriving. Apparently, it was it was blocks from the firehouse. In fact, they say if you open the doors up, you could smell smoke from the fire. So they were going to be the first ones there. When they got there, they found a, a hairy homeowner here with his uh, a green line trying to make a knock on the fire. And there was also a couple of, of civilians who were outside when they got there. Uh, the civilians met them. And it was, it was kind of funny. Uh, Captain Olson says when the civilians got to him, the first thing they said was, there's a couple of cats trapped in there. Oh, and by the way, there's a lady in there, too. <laughs> so he was taken back, taken aback by the uh, order of that. The cats came first. But, you know, again, um, they got there. They, they had a pretty good volume of fire. You can see the volume of fire there by the by the front door. This is the front door. They, they call that uh, the A side, I guess, is that's garage doors. And then the B side or. Uh, is the front door there. So they had a heavy volume of fire, but upon their 360, they saw an opportunity to get upstairs. So um, as you come around uh, the backside here, I think off of this off of this deck, uh, they saw the, a, a, a way they could get to the steps. So the first two firefighters made a dart. They made a, they made a, a rapid entry and got into the stairs. The other two guys were just seconds behind them, putting on their um, putting on their SCBA face pieces to make entry. Um, as those guys, the first two got upstairs, they shot upstairs. They thought that'd be the best way to get up. They can cover more ground than if they did like a, um, a window entry. They did a window entry search. It would be specific to one room. So if they made the stairs, they had they had their options with all the bedrooms upstairs. So the other the other two firefighters who were a little slower than them. As they made their way in, conditions changed and they weren't able to make it up the steps. So the other two firefighters are upstairs. They get into this bedroom up here. When they get into the bedroom, conditions were pretty clear, right? They closed the door behind them. The lady's like, look, I just can't get out. So they found she was in pretty good shape. Now they realize they can't get back down to the stairway to get back up. So they're calling for help, but there's nobody there. They call for a ladder, nobody there. Finally, they uh, look at them, look at each other. And they're like, we got to use our escape equipment. So they, uh, these two firefighters here kneeling next to the, to the lady decided they were going to make their exit. So the first firefighter hooked his, hooked his hook into the windowsill and he made his exit out the window. The second firefighter then took the patient, took the, uh, the occupant and put her onto, onto the first firefighter. The second firefighter gets out and they all three made their way down to the ground. In fact, in the video, you'll hear the captain made a transmission that says, I've got two firefighters from 305 hanging out a second window with a live victim. So within seconds, these, these guys um, and a civilian um, made their, their exit. They made their way out, and they even saved a life. And about that time, the other companies arrived, and they put the fire out. You can see the extent of the damage. As you look at the video, you'll see a really good damage to the room that they were in, right? There was a lot of fire damage that had made its way into that room before the fire got put out, but was was uh, after they, they made their exit. Uh, they did mention in the video that they could see the fire starting to burn down on the door. So they had, they, it was an imminent situation. They had to get out. So they did. What made it possible? Well, Mayday Mondays thinks it was good equipment, it's good training, and that rescue mindset. Right, that rescue mindset says that these guys were well prepared to use their equipment. They were so prepared that not only did they rescue themselves, they rescued somebody else. Because I don't, again, I don't, I haven't really practiced putting somebody else on me for my escape equipment. Um, Kelly, I'm sure you probably have, but I mean, uh, that's pretty rare to to prepare to bring somebody else out. But they definitely, uh, because they knew their equipment so well and they had that mindset. They were able to make sure this thing got take, got got taken care of. The rescue was made. Totally, There's some interesting things watching the video. You, you know, the, and touching on the good equipment training and mindset. You know, the fire chief said that they had invested in escape kits twenty years prior to that. Like that's you know pretty early on. I would th think in the you know the the development of that stuff. So to to have started that process you know, twenty years 
prior to this, that that's, that's a long-term investment. Um, and again, I'm just going from the video that the two guys who went in there, uh, you know, and eventually jumped out the window, they said they had trained, you know, they were trainers for their department, which, you know, tells me those guys probably have a ton of reps and, you know, know the exact exit sequence and, you know, this hand here, that hand there, and are comfortable with their equipment. You don't have to train the rest of your department to be that guy. You just have to like train with your stuff period at all. Um, and then the rescue mindset, like it was super cool to listen to the the video of those guys and they, they described their decision-making process, you know, look, the, the stairwell to the second floor was sheltered. We went up like if this doorway, if we shut it, we would, you know, basically control the flow path, which they did the first floor flashed and, you know, eventually it would, you know, burn its way through their door, but they bought themselves loads of time. Like they made really good decisions uh, and, and had a very positive outcome for it. I, I think they hit the three of those points, you know, pr- pretty well. It's, it, it was a good thing. I think one of the things that, that they have to their advantage is that they are a heavy rescue unit. So they talk about that they get to focus on rescue for rescues at fire. Sure. Right? So, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm sure that they have other responses they go on. I'm sure they probably don't just do wait for a fire to come around with, with their, you know, local alarm area, they may respond on medicals and that kind of thing. So, uh, so they're, they're definitely, you know, pulled in other directions, but for them to have, again, I think it goes back a lot to that mindset and to be, you know, to be ready, right. To be ready. Totally. I, I, I think those guys were, you know, like they, it seems like they, uh, they had it all uh, in place on that one. Uh, and, and to touch on one thing he said, he, Yes, I, I like I did work on a couple of ways of getting somebody out, you know, like an assisted lower. Uh, it is like dreadfully uncomfortable, but uh, it definitely doable. Like it's not not an impossibility. To, takes a couple extra seconds, but I would, I think it would be better than somebody on your lap. But you know, particularly from higher up than the second floor. Uh, but it, it's doable. But it, it's you know, training base. I just messed around with it for you know, a couple of years and finally come up with the way you're like, Oh crap, this, this is the way to do it. So yeah, th- there, there's a way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that there definitely is a way. Right. And that's, again, if, if you have the, if you have the initial sequence of escaping, taking care of yourself down, now you can start to dabble in, in other things to use that. Right. Cause again, it, it is, especially with some of the new advances that have been made, it makes it, it turns it into a, 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 a lowering device a lot, a lot quicker, right. And a lot, a lot safer than it used to, uh, you know, you used to have to, you know, do the, the, the couple of hitches on your hook and, and brown turns and stuff to make it a lowering device. And now it, it seems like it's the technology has gotten better that it becomes a descent, con- a descent control device or a lowering device a whole lot easier. Well, the evolution of uh, working both, both, both ends of the rope too, which I know Kelly was heavily involved with. But we, we were doing that with, uh, with some of Sterling's products where, you know, the two workable ends. So, you know, lowering a victim as opposed to taking the victim with you. But um, there's, a, there's a bunch of techniques for those. Totally. And, and a lot of the hooks, especially the ones with the, the hole in them, the hitching slot or whatever you want to call it, uh, can, can be used as a lowering device. I know uh, the Sterling hook is now rated as a descent control device per NFPA. Uh, CMC one is also rated. Like it is an on label use to use the tail end of your kit to like wrap it around somebody and fish it through the hole in your hook and use that as your friction control device to, you know, to lower somebody. So de- definitely, uh, you know, definitely a good way. And, and you're the human anchor. Like you just sit on the floor and throw them out the window and away they go. So um, do you think that that was uh I mean, there's a couple of ways to look at that, right? One of them, and I, I've been that guy where I've had an escape equipment. I've had my own personal escape system and the other guys in the crew didn't. Right. So you're like, all right, what am I going to do? Right. Am I going to be that guy that just jumps out the window and says, Hey, you're on your own. Or are you going to be that guy that looks out for right again? I mean, it depends on how you, how you woke up that morning, I guess. Uh, you have it, to decide that. I think it, well, it, it's interesting, right? So I, I think it's, uh, I think it's situation dependent, obviously, right? Like if you've got, you know, two seconds rooms flashing now, like what are you going to do? Like, you're just going to die with them. Uh, if you've got, you know, 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, like there's techniques for different 
you know, uh, time requirements. Uh, but at some point, you just have to have a very uncomfortable conversation with yourself and say, like, what am I going to do if the room's flashing? If, if my face piece is melting off and I got a kit and you don't, what, what what's going to happen? Like, I, I'm going to go. You're going to stay. And that's going to be, I'll, I'll live with myself. And, well, and, and I'm sure we're not going to get that. We're not, we're, the fire chief's probably not watching this, right? But But that's where I guess that decision needs to be made is how do I, how can I outfit my department? And, and try and get them all this this equipment you know that the writ pot the writ got the writ crew in their pocket yeah yeah outfit them because it's it, it's not a a, a a car wash we're not going to fund this by car washes no it, no you're not and it, you know there's different you know levels of kit like you can you can buy a you know inexpensive stuff with a carabiner and old figure eight descender and some you know fire resistant cord hopefully or you can get the you know, the Cadillac kits that have, you know, auto stop descenders, you can bail out hands-free or escape hands-free, uh, you know, yeah. Hey, or, you know, it, there's usually a, uh, like a, a progression of it. You know, you start off with something cheap, small and whatever. And eventually you're like, all right, this is worthwhile. I need, I need to get something a little bit better. And then you just kind of eventually settle on your final kit. I think it took me like 10 years to get my final kit though. Well, here's what they were using. This is a picture on the right is the Clackamas uh, setup. Uh, you can see they have a, a, a their, their turnout gear was outfitted with the loops and they have a fire innovations belt, which is this belt here on the bottom, uh, laced through their um, their turnout gear. And then in their pocket, um, you were said they were, they're carrying a Sterling, the F4 escape. Pretty sure they're carrying the F4 and they have a tether there to uh, send it out. Yeah. Yeah, it's either the F4 or the F FCX. Then, uh, yeah, it, it, interesting too on that harness. Like that, it's only one leg loop. I, I, I forgot what the reason for that, but it, it's a pretty unique design. But they, they seem to like it quite well. So, I'd yeah, I, I mean, I guess it's, it's it's been it's been around for a while, right? Fire Innovations yep. has been around for a while, and uh, again, I mean, it makes sense. Clackamas being West Coast, that uh, Fire Innovations is a West Coast group, um, that they would have that, and. Um, uh, yeah, it is odd. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm wondering how it kind of throws them out, which is having one leg loop, um, or right. I guess you don't put a whole lot of weight on your legs, but yeah, not not uh, much. Yeah, and it's be tough to get both of them out without the both leg loops. I would think, you know, but you know, I'd like to see how how it works. Of course, you talk about Cadillac. There's the Cadillac system in the bottom the bottom there, right? It's, it's, it's a little bit of a sticky subject here, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, yeah. This is again. This is this is a go to. This is kind of what I would go to would be an integrated harness, which we designed uh, back in two thousand nine with um, Globe and Yates. And um, again, that's the that's a nice system. There's other options out there. Again, you can use a belt. Uh, you can have it integrated. You can have a belt. You can have it on your SCBA. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the harnesses you might use uh, and then some of the rope or webbing options. Totally. Yeah. L little backstory. I, I didn't agree with Tony on his selection of a uh, escape kit. I was, I was very upset about it at the time and uh, still harbor some pretty terrible feelings, well, quite frankly. It looks like, I mean, yeah, yeah. That's why I was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I buried that, but I guess, you know, cause uh, it looks like it's worked out. I mean, again, you guys are going to get outfitted with an escape system and what we are, what are you going to do? You're going to do a belt, right? But on We're, the outside of the turnout gear. Yeah. Essentially what those Clackamas guys have minus the leg loop. And then we're getting uh, essentially that, that kit to the left there, uh, th that, that exact kit, a uh, li little change on the hook, but you know, you can see that, that, that kit has, you know, like Don was saying, you know, using both ends of the rope on that one, you know, it's, it's got the hook on one end, you know, parked right in front of your descent control device. And then it's got the carabiner on the tail end. Uh, so you can wrap it around somebody to do, you know, victim lower or, you know, writ team stuff out of Denver drill out of window kind of stuff uh, using, using the tail end of your kit if you want to. So um, unlike the Clackamas though, the Clackamas is around their turnout pants. Yeah. You guys are going around the outside of your coat, right? No, we're, we're getting, no. Uh, we're getting them in, in to the turnout pants. The last set we had ordered had metal belts. Oh, and if you don't you're not going to use, you're going to use your internal belt 
and the yeah. kit will be the, yeah. the the escape equipment will be by riding position. Correct. So yeah, you, yeah. I get. I get. It. Okay. Yep. Okay. And you guys are, are going with the webbing. Yeah, it, it packs a lot smaller than cordage, and uh, you know offers similar characteristics as far as strength and uh, fire resistance. That's come a long way. The webbing to, part of the uh, the scent control device. Totally, and I mean to look at it, it looks like fat webbing or flat rope, depending on how you want to, you know consider it but uh it has i mean every, i mean when people start you know like it, it, you get a bunch of 550 cord you're like oh, this stuff can hold 550 pounds that ought to be just fine i mean like oh, maybe not so much and then you get some eight mil nylon cord and you're like oh, that's, that's great it's you know a lot stronger but you're like oh shit it can melt and you can you know cut it on an edge or something so then you you know eventually just like i said keep going i, I used rit rit search line at first um it was not designed for the descender I had. And I, I took a couple of really fast rides on it. But yeah, eventually you just get to, you know, where we're at now technologically. Yeah. The, the webbing and the cordage is getting, you know, more heat and cut resistant and just smaller and stronger. So you guys are uh, obviously involved in sales and things like that. What do you see is, uh, is the, the popular one? Is it integrated? Is it a belt? Is it around the outside? What do you think is uh, the market share, if you will? Well, I, I think that when they first came out, it was a big bulky bag on your hip. And then came along the lumbar bag, which, um, you know, firefighters come in all shapes and sizes. So some people love the uh, lumbar bag and other people, it just, it, it, that didn't work either. Now, now I, from what I see, I see a lot of these systems migrating to, to the bunker pan pocket. And, uh, you know, having a, uh, a gear manufacturer place that pocket as high as they can on the leg and, and correct, uh, connecting directly into the harness. And it's, it's just a nice, nice streamlined stealth, uh, you know, profile for, for, uh, for a member. And that's what I see a lot of. Yeah. You know, I still have people going to those, these old school bags, but, um, I say old school. It's not that much old school. <laughs> I, well, definitely a, a, a big migration to, uh, to putting them in the, in the bunker pan pocket. Yeah, I, I think that works the best for the largest number of people. I think most people, especially if they're not into it, like they wear it because they have to, uh, like that that works best for them. Um, you know, I, I wear an external belt over my turnout coat with a lumbar bag. It just it it suits me well for the job that I do. I, I can. The, the downside is that um, if one were to choose that, you have to be disciplined to put it on for fires. Like I, I do, I, I put it on just like I put on the rest of my gear, but I like that. I don't have to wear it for the car wrecks and crawling under Metro trains and all of that stuff uh, for, for every other call other than a fire call, I guess. I, I like not having that on me. So, but yeah, I mean, you, you go into a hazmat or something, you don't want to take that with you or, or uh, yeah, if you're going to go, going to go do something else. Right. T totally. It, but, but again, I, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a rope geek. I definitely have ways I want to use this that are not, you know, normal, whatever, but, uh, but yeah, I think for the greatest number of people, Don's Don's right. Like a, a integrated pocket with a, a belt integrated into your turnout pants. So like, so it's always there on you and you just, you don't forget it. You don't. And so you just don't forget it. And what, one thing Kelly said too, that's important is, is the discipline part because, um, you know, that connection between the system in your pocket or in a bag, then connected to the harness, you know, that, that can be, a, you know, again, people come in all shapes, shapes and sizes, that can be a messy connection. And without the discipline of keeping it squared away and keeping it positioned properly, and I've seen guys dragging rope down the street or, you know, in all these different situations where, you know, they're just, just damaging a $500 escape system for no reason. Totally. But, you know, going to all these other calls, car accidents, all, all the things that were mentioned, you know, you certainly expose them to, uh, to, you know, to these different environments too. No, I think that uh, that's one thing that sometimes you forget about is you get the belt and you get a system and then you forget about how are they going to work together, right? And especially because, because it could add a snag hazard and you can kind of look at the guys here in Clackamas, right? That's that. Hopefully, that that will 
get protected the, the carabiner stuff underneath of his belt underneath of his coat excuse me but yeah it could add to uh to some snag hazards um the that's, uh that's about, like if you look at the jump to a harness in your picture that's the one thing i always liked about that that particular setup is that you you know you, know, you essentially have two working sides of that harness you know, one side is for the escape system and the other side is a working harness for positioning on the ladder or whatever, uh, you know, RID, uh, RID applications, things like that. And some of the other systems that are coming out uh, also have, you know, those two working side philosophy, which is, which is a great model. But um, I've also seen them where the front of these systems like flop, just flop there. And, uh, you know, that's certainly, like you, like you said, that, that certainly poses a snag hazard and, and it, it just goes back to discipline and, you know, uh, you know, finding the right solution for what, for what you have. Do you think that, um, again, I, I know Kelly, you prefer the outside the coat uh, option. Does that get you, I, I know with a class two, you, you kind of can get more in a seated position. Um, what is that with the, with the, around your coat, do you get to, are you more hugging the wall? And again, I, I know that we're using it for escape. No. Uh, no, you, you, can, you can still push away. It, it, it's uncomfortable. Like there's absolutely no question. It is a lot less comfortable than a class two harness um, to hang in. But I, for me, I feel that the uh, it's more comfortable to wear uh, day to day um, than a class two all the time. I always had a trouble pulling up a, our old class two harness that was integrated in our uh, turnout gear, like just, you know, pulling it up past my hamstrings or whatever. Like it would always get caught. And I, it was just, it was a pain in the butt to put my pants on. So I, uh, I took the leg loops out and, uh, went to my external belt. Well, at least you, you wore it. Right. Cause we, yeah, had, oh, yeah, every time we had like, we even had like captains of units who decided they weren't going to wear it, which yeah. I mean, it's just such a, I get it. Right. And, and we kind of talked about it earlier that it almost becomes, um, a minimum, minimum equipment as part of your turnout gear. Right. Sure. So uh, if you're complaining about the four pounds, well, then, you know, perhaps you have four pounds to lose. I don't, I don't I mean, but that's, uh, that's another thing. And I guess <laughs> I definitely see the uh, um, it was tough to see, you know, uh, the 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 people in charge to to really discount the, the need for one because they hadn't ever had to had to be in a position to use one. Sure. I, I, again, luckily, that mindset, I think fire service wide is is kind of shifting t- towards just like recognizing that it's a useful piece of gear and it's only, you know, four pounds. Like it, it ain't that much. You're right. You can lose four pounds elsewhere, you know, put down the donuts for two weeks and be fine with it. That's another May day, a Monday. Um, but what do you, have you guys see anybody really doing this? I mean, I know it's a great, um, it's another option out there. You know, we tried it in a volunteer place. We tried to have the uh, SCBA um, integrated escape thing. But it just doesn't seem like like it took off. Are you guys seeing anybody uh, doing this? Definitely not seeing anybody with that model. Uh, you know, years ago, I mean, this. I know that RIT had this model out in the late '90s. Um, not with an auto locking descender, mind you, but the integration into an SCBA. But and that 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 got a little uh, traction at the time, but. You know when the uh, when these other auto locking systems came out in 2006, these quickly, I think, went to the side. I, I don't see any of these on, on my side of things. I haven't either, and I've always been a little surprised why not. Like somebody hasn't taken it up to, you know, try a little more of it. I suspect it's manufacturers don't. You know, there's probably a lot of, uh, you know, dealing that has to go on to make an you know an SCBA frame a certified harness like that's probably not an easy hurdle to clear um and maybe it's just not worth it for manufacturers to do it 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 seems interesting like it's it's always on you you know if you're in a fire but you know i I don't know about the deployment and how it loads and all that stuff but um i don't know i I think maybe it's maybe the proper execution just hasn't been figured out yet no, yeah, that that's a good good point. Because like I said, we uh, one of the departments I was with had we had this, and you had to have like a special tool to be able to repack it. You had this yeah, long rod that was yeah, long the rod, rod to kind of the channels, yeah, yeah, to get all the stuff down into this thing here. Um, but it was it wasn't um, 
it wasn't uncomfortable necessarily. It was just, you know, then you have the problem with the guys who don't wear their waist strap. It's like, well, oh, yeah, you've we, invested in this thing and now you're not going to use that either. But I've also seen right. these too uh, in, in some places. It goes back to the word discipline again, but you'd see it just kind of act poorly or part of it hanging out or, or whatever. And, uh, you know, it's only going to be as good as the last person who inspected it, right? Sitting on the rig. Then maybe not touch for a couple of weeks or what have you, and you know now you're relying on that to be a primary life-saving device for you. Yeah, well, again, that's uh, if we're looking. Um, think speaking of that, right? We're seeing uh, as we talk about it, DC is getting ready to roll this out, and I see the guys are uh, participating in training, which is awesome. But they're rolling out a, a system that's going to be by the riding position. So again, it's going to be passed from person to person to person. Um, which, um, you know, I, I, again, coming, coming from a place that we don't have anything, I think it'd be great to have, at least have that option. Um, it's better than, you know, what they had before, probably not, it's not quite where they probably want to be, but it definitely is, um, thinking about they're investing in their people a little bit, right. They have outfitted systems. So we're, we're, we've taken, we've taken a, a better step and we've evolved into to doing this so it's 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 quality it's just not exactly where they want to be and i think you're seeing other big cities now i mean this is this is becoming a thing you know with uh like we talked about earlier it's just a it's a uh people are buying in you know we, we just contracted by baltimore city you know so that's it's a pretty big project and that's a big you know big step for them it's a big department you know so uh you know, it's, yeah. we're seeing these bigger cities now go into these systems, whereas 10 or 15 years ago, it wasn't really on the radar for them. No, it was a lot of people just buying it on their own. I know, you know, where I work, there's you know, people buying it on their own. We issued it to, you know, certain riding or certain people, not others. And, and now it, it is by riding position, which, you know, maybe not the most ideal. Like I'm sure they want the, you know, everybody would like their own. That'd be great, but that's, you know, four times the cost as well for a bigger department. So we, I, th I think it's, you know, on a trial basis for us, see, see how it goes. And then, uh, you know, maybe increase it from there. Maybe not. Who, who knows? No, and it definitely, it definitely took some, some years to do this yeah. and hopefully it will be right. It will be um, minimum, minimum equipment uh, come the future. Speaking of the future, where do you guys think um, I've always it's been tough with this with this because you find you go out if you're going to buy your own, you go out and you invest in an escape system. And then, you know, three months later, a manufacturer comes out with a, a cooler one. You know, you go out and you invest in a rope system and then somebody comes out with this flat webbing. It's like, you know, when will it end? Is there um, what, what are you seeing on the horizon as far as? Um, devices. Um, again, you're seeing departments investing, but what, what are you seeing? Well, uh, I, I don't know is the short answer. I think, uh, I think devices that don't get hung up going over a windowsill is kind of like the, the next, I mean, there's several devices out there already that do that, but I, I think there, you know, I think that'll be the trend for all devices. If you have a handle that sticks out from the side of your device at all, it's, it's just asking to get caught when you're going out a corner of a window. Um, and, and there's devices out there, the Sterling FCX, the lever, the halo, like all of those, you know, just, just plow over a, a window edge without, yeah, I mean, you don't, you don't have to measure out, like your device can be in the window when you jump out and it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter orientation, none of that stuff. It's going to plow right over the edge, no matter what. And, and I think the continuation of that would be the future. And then aside from that, maybe some sort of anchoring technology. I, I don't know if there's anything better than a hook that's going to come along, but I mean, everybody thought a carabiner was the, the bee's knees until somebody started using a hook. And you're like, oh, Christ. yeah, of course, a hook. So what, what's the next big leap in that? Don't know, but it's probably out there somewhere. Yeah, it was really hard. It was really hard to trust the hook, right? When you're yeah. telling me, you mean it doesn't even lock? And then right. it was made by some crane company. They don't know what I need. Right. You know, to in order to to initially trust that, and now to see again, right? It's because of us that's kind of driven what where it's gone. Right? The fire service has driven the 
the additional stuff and all the all the different variations on it. But yeah, initially it was kind of tough. Go ahead, Don. Yeah, no, I I agree with Kelly hundred percent as far as the uh, the sender and the ability to get over that sill because we're challenged with teaching these students to take that measurement. You know, when if you're hung up, you know, maneuvers now to overcome that. But you know, the hook is definitely a uh, you know uh, an interesting piece to this because look at look at building construction and look at private dwelling construction and you know we're going backwards with that as far as you know, being more robust, you know, a windowsill, vinyl windows, lightweight wood, you know, so, you know, the anchoring part of this is, has always been a scary part of, of the whole process. And of course, I think too, the, uh, you know, rope technology is just going to continue to evolve also. So you, I think that you're going to see this, this, whether it be webbing or the cordage, you know, evolve further and, and become smaller and more compact. You know, that, that's that CMC package is just, I mean, you can hold it in the, in, in, in your, in your, in the palm of your hand, it's nothing, you know? So um, you won't have to sacrifice going shorter rope to have a smaller, you know, profile of rope. If you if you had, you know, this newer technology that that will probably be coming at some point. Yeah. It's always been, um, Right, because you you like the bigger rope, but no one's carrying around a bag of half inch rope. Right. I mean, now you guys are even using smaller rope for for technical rescue stuff. So yeah, so I mean, uh, that's going to be smaller and smaller, and and will will increase, will will decrease the size and the bulk and that kind of thing. So um, the the. The, again, I really have been out of it, but I guess I see the lever. The lever is that you say that's got two moving parts, though. Uh, no, it's got one. It's got a little bollard in the middle that moves a little bit. Like the handle itself, the big red thing is like a, you pull on that, but that's a solid piece. the The little uh, bollard in the middle moves a little bit, uh, but but not not a whole lot. Uh, so th not, not many moving parts. And, uh, I've been using one since uh, they were prototype and they like, I've not, I've not had any issues with st stuff jamming in there. I I've broken other escape devices, uh, you know, also a CMC product, like they're, they're escape artists. I mashed on the handle, like a gorilla and I, I broke something in there. It failed into the safe position. Uh, but I was dangling in a pretty uncomfortable position. Um, but yeah, that, that you know, no real moving parts to speak of, though. All right. Well, good, good. So um, uh, you guys have uh, given us a lot of information, a lot of good stuff. I really um, appreciate you coming on. One last thing. Um, every month, right, this is all about uh, Mayday Mondays is about um, giving them a skill drill in addition to all the other information. So this month's skill drill is um, to practice, get out and practice your escape. If you have a personal escape system, definitely pull it out, you know, stretch it out, uh, um, exercise it, right? Knock off the dust, whatever. Get it out and, and use it and, and, and be ready for that. If you uh, don't have that, practice the other options. Your window hang, practice the window hang, practice the ladder, your ladder escape, whatever technique you use with that. But get out and, and practice that because um, just like these guys, these guys would. If, if you listen to the video, they talked about how they were they were tired. They had they were had a tough day. They had a two alarm fire earlier and some other stuff. It was a hot day, and they probably were dragging when they got up at three forty in the morning to go to a fire. And then they were able to perform at that level. They were able to 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 bring their A game and and more and rescue and one of the reasons they were able to do that is because their preparation and uh, they had the skills they had the, the the right tools they had the right training and then they had the right mind right mindset all parts of the mission of mayday mondays so you guys um anything to add on those i know you guys are all about training and stuff and uh um any insights yeah, one one real quick thing I wanted to touch on uh, briefly. It's like the training aspect. Uh, I, I I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, 
And, and I think like training doesn't have to be didactic and boring and sitting in a classroom. I think some of the most insightful stuff I, I was, you know, for me personally was going to find vacant dwellings, which we were lucky to have a few, and then putting a dynamometer, a load cell, something that measures force, uh, on different anchors in different vacant dwellings, like, you know, jamming a spike of a halogen bar in a hardwood floor. Like, what does that fail at? It, it, it's a lot. I haven't been able to pull one out yet. Like I put two person load on that, um, you know, crappy banisters and rotted out houses. You know, if you put a couple of turns of the rope around walls before you're, you know, finally make your exit, it's, it's probably strong enough. Like go into a vacant, put a load so you can buy them on eBay for a hundred bucks and uh, like just pull it till the stuff fails. Just know exactly what you're hooking to and like what your left and right boundaries are like that. That was very fun for me. Um, I've got a bunch of videos. I've got a bunch of, you know, I've done a, a bunch in a bunch of places and I just encourage people to do that. Like just break stuff, just write down the force like that. That makes it science. Don, anything last thing to add to today's conversation? Yeah, sure. The, uh, you know, the training is an incredibly big piece of this thing and uh, you're, you're doing great work here, Tony, with this, this uh, program. Um, as far as the escape systems go, you know, if, if your department is looking for escape systems, uh, just do your homework and ask questions, get samples, try them out, put them on your people, let your people, you know, encourage the buy-in from your people. Um, you know, we, we deal with a lot of de departments who, who, you know, maybe make a wrong decision or didn't do thorough work in, in doing the research. And then, you know, you got to do the cleanup in aisle three later on, you know. So, uh, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely. There's, there's plenty of research out there. There's plenty of people to talk to and things. So, and some of those people to right talk thing. to, some of those people to talk to are these guys. Don, what? Uh, how can somebody reach you? Don at allhandsfire.com. Right, Don at allhandsfire.com. Kelly, um, I know you're up in the. You're trying to stay away and move up in the hills of West Virginia. You don't want anybody to contact you. <laughs> but, Smoke uh, signals, uh, you know, a couple of <laughs> shotgun blasts in the air. No, yeah, uh, my, my email is Kelly K E L L Y at rescue two training dot com. That's rescue the number two training dot com. Happy to field uh, any and all questions on this stuff. Right, rescue two was the number was the second one in the program, but the first one in your heart. What's that? We're the best in Northwest. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, good stuff. Again, um, always good to see you guys. Appreciate you coming on and talking about these things. Again, be wary, all the listeners, be wary of people who have bailed out of 15 fires because they may not be the one you want to talk to. But um, there's lots of people that will, will give you insight to these things. Um, think about it as a writ on your hip. Thanks, Kelly. That was good. Good. And we're going to. I'm going to use that for uh, from now on. If there's a better term, but I was saving it for some work I'm doing in the future, but I'll, I'll give it to you anyways. Forward deployed writ team. That's that's the ticket right there. Forward deploy, deployed writ team. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right, listeners, thank you for coming. Uh, next month will be um, October. We'll have something, something good in store for you then too. Again, this month, get out, use your escape equipment, practice with your personal escape system or practice any other escape option that you have uh, because we need to be ready. All right. Uh, live to train and train to live. And thank you for coming.